It's great to welcome to the program today Adrian Barden, who's professor of philosophy at Wake Forest University and also author of the book The Truth About Denial, Bias and Self-Deception in Science, Politics and Religion. Uh, it's really great to have you on. I appreciate it. Hey, David, thanks for having me. So to start with denialism, how far back does denialism go as far as we know? I mean, were there early denialists when there were um, the you know uh, original theories about uh, what are humans and what is outer space and is whether uh, God or simply the machinations of climate or I mean like how far back does denialism go in some way shape or form well well yes all of the all of the above I I, I would I would send it back several million years as a matter of fact um, so so Homo sapiens evolved in small groups. And uh, going back further to our ancestors, they were in the same situation. And the, the, uh, it's a really important adaptive trait if you're living in a small group to be able to integrate yourself into the group's ideological worldview. You know, if your group worships Poseidon, uh, you better figure out a way to believe in Poseidon. Uh, otherwise, you're out, for example, right? Um, so it's really deep, deep in our evolutionary history that we have form this talent for rationalizing beliefs in our beliefs in order to integrate with a, a with a larger worldview. Um, so yes, and so then that moves forward through history, um, all kinds of religious beliefs, obviously, that's probably the, the beginning of it all. Um, uh, beliefs about um, other groups, because what our, our evolutionary context was we evolved in small groups that were in competition with other groups. So if we hate the group, if you know, if our group hates the group across the river, I'm going to find reasons to hate that group, too. Um, uh, otherwise, I'm not able to integrate myself into my own group because we, we don't we don't survive well on our own cooperation, social cooperation. That's our evolutionary niche. That's 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 what gives us our advantage. That's um, interesting. So, so, yeah. so early on, there was an evolutionarily advantageous reason why we were able to sort of uh, potentially suppress contradictory information in order to be in line with with our group. Does that still hold true today in the same way? I mean, is it an issue of evolutionary advantage at this point? Uh, well, it's well, a lot of things that in the past were an advantage aren't necessarily an advantage now, but it's still there. It's right. still deep, still deep in our cognitive makeup that we ha we have these skills. We're actually very, very good at adapting our beliefs, not just our behavior, but our beliefs to our situation. And uh, you mentioned, um, you know, ignoring evidence or, you know, picking out the evidence that you want, rationalizing and what's called confirmation bias, right? You ignore the evidence you don't want and you, you seek out, you know, evidence or reasons to believe what you want to believe anyway. And uh, that becomes uh, actually particularly uh, toxic in our current media environment where you can go wherever you want to, to get the worldview that um, that you want to uh, believe and you get the um, picture of the world presented to you in in, you know, HD video um, and described to you the way you want to hear it. And um, it, you know, it, and so we have what, you know, what's called these, you know, media bubbles uh, that people get into. In addition to things like our geographic sorting here in the United States in particular, people have sorted themselves very well geographically into like minded communities. Is there any uh, demographic uh, trends that you see in terms of denialism and and sort of re rejection of uh, disconform confirmatory evidence, maybe like in terms of age? Is there a certain age at which this becomes more prevalent? And if so, is is that an education or a cultural thing or anything demographically that you've observed? Well, you'll you'll hear different theories from different social scientists about this. Uh, younger people have demonstrated a little more cognitive flexibility and openness. Um, older folks are, as you would say, you know, are more set in their ways. They're also a little more sensitive to threat. Mm. They uh, feel more threatened. And that's a really big factor here. Um, if we also look at the uh, progressive slash liberal versus conservative ways of thinking about the world. Um, so where conservatives and conservatives obviously skew at this point in the U.S. Uh, wider and older, obviously. Um, conservatives, um, by definition, are what we call system justifiers. They are pro-status quo. 
conservatives are comfortable with the way things are in terms of the social and economic order and its hierarchies. And um, they will, they will uh, seek out reasons to um, dismiss evidence that there's something wrong with that order, um, such as uh, you know, systemic inequality. Um, and uh, and uh, younger people are less prone to do that. So it seems like there's an asymmetry there in the sense that when you talk about the status quo and you think about inertia, certainly it takes less energy to maintain the status quo in general, all else being equal than it would to change the status quo. And so there is a, a sort of it seems that there would be a structural advantage to those who are predisposed to keep things the same because it's, it's easier to do so in a sense. Well, the status quo is upheld by all kinds of systems, for example, the police. Um, the police are the in any society, the police are the tip of the spear when it comes to maintaining the social and economic hierarchy. Um, that's what they're that's when we say law and order, that's what the order part of that means. Uh, you know, when Trump calls himself the law and Nixon calls himself the law and order president and yeah. Trump calls himself the law and order president. That's what the order is. The order is maintaining the cur current social and economic hierarchy. Um, and that includes obviously um, systems of uh, systemic uh, racial bias and um, and, and uh, systemic uh, in a, uh, structural economic inequality. I'm interested in climate change in this context because uh -huh. we could think about a way in which um, denying climate change goes against the known facts um, and may be advantageous if you're part of certain political groups, right? So, in order to keep the peace, as you suggest, we may have this tendency to say, hey, let's, uh, I'm going to, even if there's information that suggests climate change is real and it's man made. I'm going to stick with my group. But over the long term, if it's true what science says about the climate, uh, it's self destructive to the human race and to the planet. So it seems that there there is a long term disadvantage when it comes to the, the sort of evolutionary aspect of it. How could how should we interpret climate change de denial in this context? David, I'm very interested in climate change denial. Uh, so I'm glad you bring it up. Uh, the first thing I'd want to stress is that uh, uh, being a climate science denialist has nothing to do with being stupid mm -hmm. or being uneducated. In right. fact, we, what we see is the reverse. If you're if you're a conservative, you're more likely to be a climate science denier if you have college education. You're more likely when you give people uh, tests, not just on science literacy, but climate science literacy, you're more likely to be a denier if you're conservative that when you score higher on cl a climate science literacy test. So what is that telling us? That telling us is that we are, we are really good at rationalizing our own beliefs. The more information we have, the more ammunition we get to rationalize those beliefs. This puts us in a classic uh, game theoretical situation. I don't know if I want to get too technical on this, but um, yeah, where individual uh, decisions about what's best for them in terms of what belief systems they want to hold on to become collectively absolutely disastrous in the long run. So that's interesting. So, so in other words, the the more information we have, maybe not the more that our beliefs align with what we would call an empirical reality, but the better we are at justifying the beliefs that we have. Well, we have more capacity to rationalize. It doesn't, it doesn't mean we have to, but there is a definitely a tendency to do so. I mean, we, we love to think of ourselves as these purely rational beings and all our beliefs are based on evidence and listening to qualified experts. But in practice, that's not what happens when there, when it's beliefs, um, when the, when they're, we're presented with facts that are threatening to us. Um, so our, our, our very sense of identity, is based on the groups that we, you know, feel associated with. Um, um, our, uh, our, like, if I if I said to you, David, David, tell me about yourself, right? I'm, I'll, I'm going to tell, I'm going to make up some things about you. So I say, I say, hey, David, tell me about yourself. To who are you? And you'd say, well, like, well, you know, I was, I was born in Rhode Island, but I grew up in Texas. Uh, my parents immigrated from Ireland. I'm a Methodist. 
Um, I'm a social conservative, but I feel strongly about the environment. And all of those facts that when you tell me all about yourself, all of those things are, are relations you have to other groups and in, in terms of their ideological worldview. That's your identity. So when you're presented with facts that challenge um, the, the, uh, the worldviews of the groups that you associated with, it feels like a personal attack. You have an emotional response. And our brains are totally set up to defend themselves. And we defend ourselves by um, through rationalization, confirmation bias, what we call motivated reasoning. You have a conclusion in mind. There's no such thing as climate change. And then you seek out reasons to believe that and you discount the reasons you're given to um, believe that there is climate change, right? And once again, in our media environment, you can always find what you're looking for when you're looking for reasons to rationalize your own belief system. So that gets me to, to sort of the last major thing I want to touch on, which is we've yeah. now widely read and researched and, and discovered that just giving people more facts and data is not very effective at changing minds. In fact, it can do the uh -huh. opposite. As you say, people can see that as a threat and, and further kind of plant their feet in, in where, where they are. Right. Uh, what are the more effective ways to get people to reconsider their beliefs and to throw out just a couple of things? The one debate that I've had with some people and Nathan J. Robinson, when, when I spoke to him, he felt very strongly that appealing to people on the basis of their values and tying that to the conclusion you want is not a good idea. So, for example, like appealing to to fiscal conservatives to end the death penalty on the cost issue, when in reality that may not be the primary reason I might right. want to end the death penalty. There's debate over whether that's a good idea or a bad idea. Ballpark for us the best strategies for effectively getting people to change their beliefs. I, I agree with that. Um, there's a lot of talk about message framing, basically marketing your message to your audience, frame it in their values, in terms of their values. Hey, you're a conservative. Let's talk about conserving the environment, right? Mm. You're, an, you're an evangelical. Let's talk about caring for God's creation. Um, maybe over the very long term with a lot of interactions, and if you put that all in the right context for a long period of time, that could change people's minds. A few interactions along those lines, it's like, it's like uh, what was that old king who, who took his sword and tried to stop the, the, the waves come, from coming in, right? Mm, right. Um, it, it, people have this lifetime of cultural identifications and, and identity that, that are just gonna blow that, that kind of intervention out of the water. Um, I would I would say rather um, appeal to local issues that are of local interest, right? Talk about okay. I was just reading about Miami and the fact that Miami is there's saltwater intrusion into the freshwater supply. In my, now everyone in everyone in Southeast Florida, no matter what political persuasion you are, really cares about having drinking water and not having flooding, right? So don't talk about climate change. Don't talk about the evidence for climate change. Just say, okay, we've got a seawater problem in our freshwater supply. Uh, what do we do about that? I would start there. Um, you know, you talk about, you know, in the in the um, uh, in the American West, talk about drought um, in an agricultural community, right? I would start there. That's I'm afraid that's that's not that doesn't take you all the way to the kind of global systemic change that we really need. Um, but that's the beginning. Uh, there's things you could do in K through 12 education with regard to science education that I think would be much better. Instead of teaching people science facts, we should we should be teaching kids um, scientific method. Uh, we're really focusing on that about curiosity, about debunking um, uh, uh, claims that are not well founded, and and educate educate kids that. But I mean, that's a generational thing. The thing about climate change is that we don't really have time for that. Um, so it's an urgent crisis, and and I, I don't have this sort of magic bullet in terms of a message where we, where we can send out this message. Yeah. And we're going to convert everybody, including those people who are invested in the status quo so heavily that they're going to discount um, that evidence automatically. Um, it's tough. But certainly I, I agree that at a systemic level, starting with media literacy and critical thinking far earlier as well, we are we are kind of it's a long game, but we are sort of better, better setting up society to 
uh, think think in that way. The book is the truth about denial, bias and self-deception in science, politics and religion. We've been speaking with the book's author, Adrian Barden, who's professor of philosophy at Wake Forest University. Really appreciate your time today. Thanks so much, David.